If I'm the champion, the whole UFC division should be ashamed of themselves for letting a guy that had no damn skills become the champion. They should all just relocate somewhere. And with that, welcome to the Stop with your show with the news of the day. It's usually even just enough time, but sometimes not enough. If this is your first time stopping by. We thank you and get ready for something you won't find anywhere else. I'm John Franklin. I'm joined by the god father of Fight Night Picks, Craig Allen. Craig, how are you? John, I'm well. Listen, it's just like spring training. Early stoppage has been away. We got to get our reps back. I'm playing minor league baseball with your Portland Sea Dogs. I'm ready to go. Listen, I'm back at home. I've been recording from, what I don't know, elsewhere. I was in Nova Scotia. I was Portland. in Quebec. I was in Prince Edward Island this week. I'm going back to Nova Scotia next week in New Brunswick right now. I'm just traveling the provinces. Loving life. Loving life. Mr. Well, you're not Mr. Worldwide. Are you Mr. Canada? What would you call yourself? Like Captain Canada, like the old superhero. Captain Canada. That's it. On this episode of Early Stoppers, we talk the CEO of EPO, the tweet and delete game, and Duck Hunt. But we begin with the go to the heavyweight division. Craig Stipe Miosic isn't happy, and he has good reason. He feels that based on the rematch situation with him and Daniel Cormier, that the fact that he holds a win over Francis Ngannou should have warranted an immediate rematch. It didn't. I mean, in fairness, Francis isn't even the next person fighting for the heavyweight title. Stipe has voiced his displeasure and has even begun flirting, wink, wink, with one championship. Craig, one, is Stipe right here? And two, is he going about this the right way? I want to hear from the commenters on this one, because you know I'm going to read the comments. I'm not a Brandon Shaw, but I don't just pussyfoot around it. But for me... I look at it and, well, we're reading the comments. I mean, Stipe had the old comment under the Instagram <laughs> post from one championship. It seems like it's a little attractive to go over there. Don't really know what their monetary situation is. But, John, if I'm Captain Canada, then what does that make Arjan Buller? Like, is he what's better than Captain Canada? Because that guy's your one championship heavyweight champion. How exciting is that? I absolutely love it. And I thought he was a good talent with the UFC and a very nice guy, too. And... He knew where New Brunswick was. So, again, all the credit in the world to Arjan Buller, BC's finest. But when I look at Stipe Miasic, yeah, I, I think he should have had an opportunity to rematch or, I guess, make a trilogy with Francis Ngannou right off the bat. I think he was more than deserving. But the trouble for Stipe, and that's where I want to hear from the commenters, maybe not the most marketable guy. Kind of sounds like he's got marbles in his mouth. Had that Modelo sponsorship, but like he's kind of like an everyman. If every man could beat the shit out of you at a fireman's bar. So that's kind of the thing. Like he's in a really weird spot. I think he's deserving, but I can see why the UFC decided to go in a different direction. And even then, I don't agree with the, our next heavyweight title fight or our interim title fight between my guy, Cyril Gaon, and Derek Lewis. It's just a weird bucket of muscles right there. It is. Nobody seemingly is the most important fighter when he fights and the least important fighter when he doesn't quite like Stipe Miocic, he has this thing where one minute he's just figuring out if he's going to fight Nganu next or Jones, then he's fighting neither, then he's not fighting for the belt, then Nganu's not fighting for the belt. There's a lot going on, and I think that he has done what he's done perfectly for the purposes of his career, right? Like he couldn't have expected that Francis Nganu was going to improve that much in between fights. Um, but I think that it's – it's interesting for me that he doesn't quite know how to navigate these waters. He isn't every man. He's not a guy that has like, you know, uh, I think he's with Gary V. So I think Gary V is not really a guy who necessarily knows. He's certainly not going to go strong arm Dana. So, well, he definitely knows the sports card world. Cause he's just he he bumped the value up on this stuff. I, I think that if I'm steep, a, here, I'll throw another question at you, which I'm, which I'm apt to do. Do you think that if Stipe were to leave the UFC, and listen, he's under contract, it's going to be very difficult to do. Do you think that if, if he were to leave the UFC and go to one championship and just finished out his career with wins there, do you think the fact that he, him and Derek, uh, I'm sorry, Francis Ngannou have split their fights, does he keep his GOAT status or does the fact that he last lost to Ngannou sort of put everything in question? That's a really interesting question because, I mean, I look at it for, like, a Demetrius Johnson. Is Demetrius Johnson still flyweight goat even though he went to one championship and lost to Adriano Morais? 
I think he's still the greatest flyweight ever. I don't think that loss takes away. And yeah, mm. is that up at Bantamweight? And really, how big was Adriano? I don't know. Great interview with him on our channel with one JHK MMA after that fight. But to answer the question, I, I don't think it really tarnishes his legacy. It all depends on what France is able to do after the fact. And if he's able to capture some of that glory and get some successful wins going. And I think he's got a good opportunity with the way that he was able to finish Stipe. But no, I, I don't think it does uh, tarnish anything if he goes over there. there you and we move, move on. on, John. It looks <laughs> like we have a title fight at 170 pounds. The Underground Whisper Network is reporting that Kamaru Usman's old friend, Colby Covington, is targeting a date of November 6th at MSG. We're going back to New York. John, has Covington earned this rematch and is there any reason to think that this fight's going to go any differently than the first one? Well, I think that he's earned the rematch because he fought well enough in the first fight for the outcome to be a little bit in the balance. I mean, I thought it was Kamaru Usman's fight throughout, but, you know, based on what Usman did to Masvidal, Covington obviously showed himself to be a better fighter in that fight. There was a little bit of controversy at the end. I don't necessarily... I'm not one that thinks there was controversy, but there's enough scuttlebutt about it, if you will, that there's, you know, there's there's something in the wind. Obviously, they don't like each other. And I got to say, the CEO of EPO is one of Kobe Covington's better lines. It's certainly better than Marty Fake Newsman. I mean, listen, Covington has some that fall flat. The CEO of EPO is not one that fell flat. That was a home run level uh, shit talk maneuver by Kobe Covington. So, listen, I think there wasn't a lot of wrestling in the first fight for obvious reasons. I think that that there's you could make a case and you could promote a fight that says if Covington chooses to engage in the wrestling, if Covington pushes the pace a little bit more, that you could build an argument that the second fight will be better than the first. The boxing in that fight was insane. I had Covington winning it into the fifth round. If he was able to finish it out, I had him winning uh, three rounds to two. And then ultimately Usman finishes him. And he goes on this wild streak of just finishing guys. Whereas Colby Covington took time off, beat the tire out of Tyron Woodley. And then now we're here. So I guess waiting it out for him actually proved to be a smart idea. And listen, Colby Covington is one of those guys that you just keep throwing shit at the fan and hoping that it hits. And finally, the CEO of EPO, I'm sure that took him a long time. <laughs> Did he have to hire any porn stars to sit around him so he could get his Instagram pictures? I, listen, I don't know what this guy, I don't know what the move to MMA Masters is going to do for him. Obviously, we saw what happened in the, the Woodley fight. But I mean, Woodley didn't look good for a number of fights. So it is really tricky to tell how that move is going to pay out or play out in a fight against Usman. I'm down for it. I like it. The bad blood there is going to be really interesting because Colby Covington doesn't really have any of the polarity to draw off of like he did the last time. Like, is he going to go on the, and I want to get it right. Was it the Candace Owens show that he was on? Yeah. That was it. Is he going to have a platform like that again? So it's going to be really tricky to see how Covington markets himself going into this one. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, one thing that he better, you know, pray to the God of skinny punks that doesn't happen is that Jake Paul knocks out Tyron Woodley. Because if Jake Paul knocks out Tyron Woodley, boxing match, whatever the hell you want to say, it is not going to look good for Kobe Covington going into that next fight. Craig, can we move on? Craig, TJ Dillashaw, Dillashaw won a controversial to some. Split decision victory over Corey Sand. Hog, sand. <laughs> sand hate Sand. I think it's Sandhagen. We'll go with Sandhagen. Two Saturdays ago, and before the fight, Aljamain Sterling said that with a win, Dillashaw deserves a title fight. So the question here is, did that performance warrant a title shot, in your opinion? Hashtag number two, TJ Dillashaw. Just grabbing that crown. Kyler Phillips, see you later. Who are you? Holly and Piva left scratching his head. Um, No, no, no. Piotr Jan deserves a title shot over uh, TJ Dillashaw. And listen, I know you and I were excited about this fight last weekend between these two guys. I thought that Sand... Casuals will say that it's Sandhagen, right? <laughs> Casual early stoppage fans. Casual say part, it's fake. If this is the first time that you've watched early stoppage, uh, maybe I baited you in with a thumbnail. Maybe I baited you in with a title. But the name of the show was Early Stoppage. There's so many people out there that if I posted a picture, and I will, 
of Sandhagen and Dillashaw. And I put early <laughs> stoppage. People go, but no, it wasn't an early stoppage anyway. That's neither here nor there. But out of the fight, I didn't even think that Dillashaw won. Uh, so that's a tricky one. Plus, he's got to have some uh, different surgeries on, uh, what was it? ACL, MCL, a little bit of knee issues there. Due in part to that crazy submission maneuver by Sandhagen very early on in that fight. So to me, I don't think the performance warranted a title shot. He still needs one more. But he was in a tricky position anyway because even before the Sandhagen fight was announced, Dillashaw was going on the media tour of, well, I was guaranteed a title shot. Well, now he's got to win. So I would think maybe there is a guarantee in there somewhere. Yeah. You know, the Piotr Jan thing of it all, I just feel like, and maybe this is just Aljamain Sterling trolling, but I just feel like he's just avoiding Petr Jan, and I don't think that he's afraid to fight him because obviously he fought him already. I, I just think that he thinks, I don't want to say he thinks it's funny, but it's like for all the shit that he, he's catching about the way that the fight with Jan ended, it's almost like he's keeping it going by saying, well, do you really deserve a or should I really reward you for a foul? Or I mean, listen, if you're Aljamain Sterling, you're sitting here going, well, listen, do I reward the guy who committed a foul in my fight or do I reward the guy that, you know, took EPO? Um, I, I think he's the vice president of EPO. For Maybe he's the uh, CFO of EPO. I don't know. We'll have to ask um, Colby Covington. But, I, yeah, I, I, it's interesting to me how Sterling is navigating all this. I think that defeating uh, Sondhagen, certainly by uh, by any accounts, if you defeat him, certainly off of that much a time off, hashtag Dominic Cruz says ring rust is not real. Um, I think that, yeah, if you, if you defeat a guy that caliber in the way that he defeated him, I, I listen, side note, I think Corey Sandhagen learned a huge lesson that night, which is what a championship fighter is. Because I firmly believe – and you can hear this on the recap show on the Patreon. I firmly believe that Sandhagen thought when he busted up Dillashaw, that Dillashaw was going to just go away. And the Dillashaw, that Dillashaw, the fans, the doctor, Dana, everybody thought it was a wrap. The only person that didn't think it was a wrap in reality was TJ Dillashaw. And that's probably why Sandhagen lost. Because Dillashaw stuck around, stayed in the fight, and, and really outworked him. Uh, did you see, I mean, you're talking about Aljamain Sterling going away. Did you see him on Marab Dojvili's Instagram? Have you seen no. what they're up to going no, over to Georgia? They're dancing. They're swimming in the rivers. I would think Marab of all people would have learned that swimming in strange bodies of water are pretty detrimental <laughs> to your health after jumping into that ice and running into the sticks, but we'll move on from there, John. It's raining pay-per-views. Hallelujah. It's raining pay-per-views. In the month of October, we're going to be blessed with not one, but two numbered UFC events. But you won't have to DM your buddy for a stream for one of them, as UFC 267 is free. So the question is, John, how dumb is this? And why not just make it a fight night? And what are we doing here? Um, You know, listen, when we see the, if you don't know, now you knows with Dana White, he's got the big board. I'm sure he's got a calendar. This is goes, the fight I told you about, or I was yeah, telling you about. I'm sure that Dana White somewhere has a huge wall with a calendar that goes to my son's fucking 21st birthday <laughs> that has everything lined up. And I, maybe UFC 300 is going to be in July of 20-whatever, and he's just trying to keep everything, you know. I don't I, – listen, I will say this. For – a free pay-per-view, it's a pretty nice card. I mean, it's no it's no sucker card for sure. It's got some fights on it. So I don't know if because of the caliber of fighters you make in a pay-per-view. Um, you know, one thing that I hadn't thought about until just now is that maybe if you're going to be giving champions pay-per-view points, that comes into effect, but then it's free. So how does that – I don't know. If you're if – you're, <laughs> by the nature of calling something a pay-per-view, you really can't make it free. Isn't that redundant like jumbo shrimp? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, that's it. Pay per view. Free pay. <laughs> free pay. Um, it starts early, right? So it's October 30th, 2021. Uh, you've got the card starting at 11 a.m. Eastern. You talked about it. Aljamain Sterling, Piotr Jan for the Bantamweight belt. And then you've got, uh, what is it? 
Glover to share taking on Jan Blahovic. Like it, it is a good card, but you're right. Return really of combat. There's a few yeah, things happening that night. It, it, it's it's as weird as when at the start of this year you had a Wednesday card, Michael Chiesa, Neil Magny. And I was all excited for it, but I couldn't watch it because it was during the day and on a Wednesday. So now we're going pay-per-view, but it's free. I scratch my head. The one thing that I can kind of point to is the fact that, you know, you've heard Dana White come out and talk about the fact that the UFC didn't even figure that they'd be making money off of some of their cards. Now, they're fight nights, and they made a pretty big deal about it. I think uh, I watched after the fights last weekend. I was salty. I stayed up for quite a while on the, the Twitter sphere. And Brendan Fitzgerald over on Instagram was uh, live streaming. So I made a couple of comments and I watched along and he said, yeah, it was pretty neat because at the apex, we have fans there. Now you can get these VIP packages. You can be a fan, but also at the pay-per-views, they have fans and they're filling stadiums at this point, but the UFC didn't account for revenue or they didn't project for revenues like this until later on in 2021. So I think all of that coupled with the fact that, I mean, listen, D Disney plus, we made it. Who would have thought? Not us. They made <laughs> Disney Plus, or they made ESPN Plus, rather. So they, they've done a great job for uh, you know their parent company. I think this is one of those things where, A, you reward the fans with a great card for free, but B, I'm sure this helps out with ESPN and marketing as well. So free per view it is. Yeah, I think, too, there's probably some piece of paper somewhere that says you, you owe, you know, you're obligated to a certain number of pay-per-views per year. They may be um, sort of uh, not inclined, but like they may be like, maybe they like fight nights being in Vegas. Maybe they, maybe that's their thing. Now they're like saying, okay, it costs us so much to travel and uh, we're not I, quite no. certain. Go ahead. Uh, no, sorry. And I want to push back against it. No, because they come out and said that the fight nights are the bread and butter. And that's what really kind of greases the wheels. If you want to go that way, unless you have oiled hubs. But if you look at it, like I'll give you Canada as an example, and I'm not going to go on for very long about this, but they like to have a fight night in the East. They like to have a fight night in the West. And then they have their pay-per-views kind of spread out. So whether it's Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Vancouver, not so much. And they never go to Montreal anymore. But that's how they get the brand awareness out there. That's why you have UFC Nebraska. They, they've they talked about it. They don't want to do that. For now, I think the apex with the COVID situation. But I think as soon as, you know, you don't have your fourth yeah. wave goes away, they're going to keep doing fight nights everywhere. Yeah, and I, and I remember that being the thing that they kind of did pre-pandemic. So, yeah, it might be the thing where it's like, you know, like you said, the whole Delta variant of it all may be the thing that's preventing them from like venturing out of fight nights. But I mean that you'd think that that would affect the pay-per-views as well. So who knows? All right, Craig. And we move on. Craig, have you seen Justin Gaethje? Who? Me neither. It seems that the 155 pound action fighter has been off the grid, Jason Bourne style for some time. Many have speculated as to why, but only one man, Michael Chandler, Believes Gaethje's disappearance is because of him. Craig Chandler says Gaethje's ducking him. What say you? Michael Chandler, the newest Justin Gaethje. Justin Gaethje. What was his last fight? Hamzat Shemaev? <laughs> it seems like it. It no, seems like it's I been forever. He fought Habib last October. He got finished. Habib didn't want to brutalize him in front of his family, so he just kind of slept him off into the night. I don't know what the scoop is. Uh, it's one of those ones where does management just want him to sit out until the right opportunity presents itself? W what opportunities are out there for Justin Gaethje right now? Not going to get another fight with Dustin Poirier. Connor's out of commission. Rafael Dos Anjos, maybe. Uh, Benil Dariush, maybe. Like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I mean, you really dig into it. I I'm assuming that that's what they're going for. They're going to wait for the right opportunity. I would think that a Michael Chandler fight is the right opportunity. But again, if I go down through the lightweights, yeah, there's not many people that have fights booked right now. Diego Fe has a fight booked against Grant Dawson. Dan Hooker doesn't have any fights. Makachev doesn't have a fight. Dariush doesn't have a fight. Uh, Oliveira is probably going to fight, like we said, Dustin Poirier, I would assume. So it, it's a weird, weird spot if you're Justin Gaethje. And for an all-action guy, you're not creating much action right now. Yeah, I mean, listen, you don't have to think too hard about this, really. If you, if you want to figure out 
what to do. I think that he wisely got on the Connor track. But the problem with being on the Connor track is Connor has so many options that, yeah, if Connor had lost to Poirier, came out healthy, and was ready to move on, first, Connor, if he was if he were healthy, can sit there and start um, campaigning for the third fight. Um, but well, actually, this was the third fight, so he could have campaigned for the fourth fight. But I think that Gaethje makes a lot of sense for Connor. But in waiting for Connor, Gaethje kind of put himself on ice. I think the most obvious thing here, and and if I'm missing something, please tell me, is Dan Hooker and Justin Gaethje. I mean, that's the fight, isn't it? Yeah, but Dan Hooker's lost fights recently. I mean, that's that's the one tricky thing. Dan Hooker's lost two in a row. Uh, he lost to Dustin Poirier. He lost to Michael Chandler. I I, I don't. I'd sooner see like Makachev. I'd love to see Darius, but that's the tricky thing. And then you talk about. Justin Gaethje's on the Connor path. Well, not that long ago, he's on the James Vick path. So yeah. it's it's kind of a weird one. Obviously, he's fought really big names, and I kid, but it's it's a weird one. And if you want to talk about the Connor path, let's end with Connor McGregor because the master of the tweet and delete is one Connor McGregor. And this week, he sent a tweet about Habib Nurmagomedov's father that was so trash. I won't even quote it here. Suffice to say, it was scumbag stuff. So. The question is, at what point are we done just chalking Connor's behavior up to fight promotion? At what point does he need to be punished for his behavior? And I think we found it out because at what point does Daniel Cormier have to start to comment on this stuff? And it reverberates all over social media. Yeah, I think that uh, this one is going to be a matter of, you know, when you're the golden goose or you're the goose that laid the golden egg, you are going to get different treatment than other people. You know, I've, I've quoted this before the old Jimmy Johnson line, which is, you know, there, a guy fell asleep in one of his meetings back in the day and he cut him. And a reporter said to Jimmy Johnson, what would you have done if Troy Aikman fell asleep in the meeting? And Jimmy Johnson said, I would have woke him up. Because the rules are different for Troy Aikman than they are for this guy. Um, I think that that's how Dana looks at Connor. But if you are Khabib Nurmagomedov and you are Daniel Cormier, you have a big enough voice to, to now make this your issue. If I were Khabib, I would start really putting pressure on Dana to see, to make Dana take a stand here and say, are you going to take the fact that I'm no longer, I'm retired and DC's retired to just sort of blow us off because this guy makes you a lot of money? Or are you going to actually take a stand here? Because you know that this is, you know, Connor really more than anyone else. You know, I, I tell my kid all the time, um, there's a fine line between silly and disrespectful because he says certain things that I'm like, you being silly, you being disrespectful. <laughs> there's a fine line between silly and disrespectful, my friend. And I think that there's a fine line between fight promotion and disrespect and Connor walks it. And usually he's on the right side of it. This side, he's on the wrong side. This time he's on the wrong side of it. And it might be time for the UFC to do something about it. People have started to live for this. So I'm going to give into it. If you made it into 23 minutes of early stoppage, here's a nugget for you. See my heart, I decorated like a grave. You don't understand who they thought I was supposed to be. Look at me now, a man who won't let himself be. John, in the 90s, like, where were you in terms of grunge? Where was I? I'm going to be honest. Because I am a huge fan of grunge now. All right? In the moment, hated it. I liked old school hip hop. Thought Kurt Cobain, and I did not like it. No, two reasons. Two reasons I didn't like grunge. It killed hair metal, which I liked, and it was sort of adversarial to hip hop, which I liked. So yeah, I wasn't a, dr a grunge fan when I was younger, but I love it now. Uh, Allison Chains, love them now. Hated them then. Down in a hole. That's where Conor McGregor is. That's the song I sung. Uh, Jar of Flies is a great uh, Alice in Chains EP. And I could go on for, we could do an Alice in Chains podcast with Craig Allen. But I had, my first car was a 2000 Chrysler Cirrus. It had a tape deck. A friend of a friend of mine knew that I liked Alice in Chains, gave me a Jar of Flies EP cassette. And I bang that shit every day. So for me, I look at it. Conor McGregor's down bad. He's down in a hole. He continues to dig himself a hole. Now, if Daniel Cormier is starting to come out and really, again, like I said, reverberate around social media, calling you out for your comments, that's not where you want to be. 
uh, it's not looking good for this guy. And, and do I feel bad for him? Not necessarily, but somebody in his team has to kind of take the phone away at some point in time. And I don't know if he's got that guy in his team anymore. I mean, we're going to talk about it later on, but one of his main guys just retired. I, who else does he have? Is John Cavanaugh going to take the phone away? No. Owen Roddy's not really there so much anymore. So I think it's only going to get worse before it gets better. You know, it's funny. Somebody said once, uh, I think it was the game, he had a joke about Eminem. And he said, it, he said, in all the time that I feuded with 50 Cent, I never went at Eminem. And this is the game's quote, not mine, but he said, the reason why is because you don't fuck with the white boy. Because he never wanted to do a diss track on Eminem because he didn't want the diss track to come back on him. And he was like, that's just not something you want to engage in. Throughout Conor McGregor's career, he's not somebody you want to fuck with. Because whatever you say about him publicly, he's going to say something about you worse. But I think now there's some kinks in the armor and people are willing to go at him. It'll be interesting to see how far DC wants to push this because DC has always been a friend of Khabib's and in the past has really kind of, again, straddled that line of like, at what, to what extent am I going to be critical of Connor and defend my friend and to what extent am I not? The, It'll be interesting now that Connor's star is a little bit diminished if people are willing to go at him, sort of like people are willing to go at Eminem when his star diminished. I mean, the best trump card to all of this is video, and I saw it on Reddit that came out, and it was of Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov after the fight against Habib, where he said, yeah, Connor's free to come to Dagestan. He's free to come and train with us. Like, bygones are bygones, and words are words, and at the end of the day, it was a fight, and it already happened. So, I mean, if a guy can say something like that, and then Conor McGregor's still kind of dancing on his grave, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty low class. Pretty yeah, low class. All right, Craig, we move on to sparring sessions. We never do this, but we're doing it this week, which is the opening quote is going to be the subject of sparring sessions. So I'll revisit it. The quote is from Derek Lewis, if I'm the champion, the whole UFC division should be ashamed of themselves for letting a guy that had no damn skills become the champion. They should all just relocate somewhere. So here's the question for sparring sessions. You know, Derek Lewis you know, does a lot of things with, as they used to say, tongue planted firmly in cheek. I think that he's not fully being serious here, but you can make an argument that what he's saying is true. So he is not the least skilled heavyweight ever in the history of the UFC. If you want to see that guy, just go to the comedy store. He does stand up all the time. But I would say that Derek Lewis. That guy knocked out Mirko Krokop. Show him is, a little bit of which respect. Is the, just a which little is bit. the saddest day in MMA history. Um, what do you think about what Lewis said? Do you buy into this? Do you completely disagree with him? Uh, let's, let's take his words at face value. Obviously, he's fucking around a little bit. But if we take his words at face value, do you agree with them or do you disagree with them? I get the idea, right? I mean, it's not like he's a wrestler. He doesn't have the crispest, quickest boxing. He doesn't throw tons of combinations. He throws a lot of power. He has a lot of heart. Sometimes he's a little fleet of foot. And and sometimes he gets hurt. Yeah, I get it. I mean, you match up Derek Lewis, and obviously he's beaten Volkov, but you match him up against a Volkov, a Gon, anybody really in around the top 15. You look at his fight against even Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades, I mean, should have beat the, the bejesus out of him, but he didn't. Derek Lewis is just one of those weird anomalies in MMA. So I kind of agree with this quote. I don't feel like I have a lot more to add on it, but it's one of those weird ones. I, I don't see him being Cyril gone at all. But then again, it's always hard to pick Derek Lewis to win. So I, I'm eager to get your thoughts on this one because I know you thought long and hard about it. Just go <laughs> off. Just go off. And I think the the worst heavyweight that was ever in the UFC, and I I'm, his name's not popping up, who was the Boston cop that fought Kimbo Slice one time? Oh, Sean Gannon, maybe? Yeah, that's it. All right, so here's the deal. Um, I will say this. The, the way that I yeah, the way that I need to process this is would it be worse if Derek Lewis were the heavyweight champion or Greg Hardy? So because at least Derek Lewis well, one guy's hates, good at fighting and one guy's not. Well, what I mean by that is, is if we're saying neither is skilled, 
as a fighter, right? Which is more of a, um, you know, a, a complete bastardization of the heavyweight division, Hardy or Lewis. Here's what I know. I know, Gre- I know that Derek Lewis made his debut in 2010. It's 2021. I know that he's 25 and seven. So whatever he is or whatever he isn't, he's been working it out for 11 years. So he came to fame as a fighter. Like, I didn't know who Derek Lewis was before he was a fighter. I know him as a fighter and only as a fighter. So for the last 11 years, you know, he might not be, uh, you know, doing a submission underground or, you know, Eddie Bravo's thing or going over to Abu Dhabi and doing ADCC. The guy's not a, a, a grappler, but he's been fighting for 11 years. So for me, he is a fighter. That's his occupation. And Greg Hardy is like the old Adam Sandler thing of like, I'm a hockey player, but I'm playing golf today. And Greg Hardy's a football player, but he's fighting today. I think that Greg Hardy being the heavyweight champion of the world would be much worse for the heavyweight division and be much more of a commentary on the lack of skill in the heavyweight division than if Derek Lewis were to win the belt. And I mean, it's a good thing that it will never happen. So from that... <laughs> We're going to move on to our featured segment. And this is my favorite one because a early stoppage has been away for a little bit, but B this one makes John very nervous it's called hitting the speed bag. And if you've never seen hitting the speed bag, if you've never heard it, I have five questions that John is not privy to whatsoever. I start the two minute timer when I finish the first question and we get moving. John, are you ready? Taking a sip as ready as I ever am for this. All right, the timer starts after I ask the first question. John, Hector Lombard wants a piece of Tyron Woodley these <laughs> days, and who doesn't want to see them throw down? In BKB, John, I want to know, what's your dream fight in bare knuckle? Better question. Is it grounds Is it f- uh, grounds for fighting if someone tries to screw your side piece? That's a, that's a question for the Patreon, <laughs> because that's where this came from. Uh, a better, say it again, a better BKFC fight than that? Get, yeah, give me your dream bare knuckle fight. My dream bare knuckle fight would be wow, that's a good question. My dream bare knuckle fight would be present day, whatever shape they're in. Boss Rutten and Randy Couture. That's a great one. Your son's <laughs> beloved Cubs are wheeling and dealing, sending Anthony Rizzo to the Yankees, among other moves. John, what's one MMA trade? promotion of promotion that you'd like to see in 2021 oh great question give me man what is what i'd like to see bader back to the ufc i'd go the winner of this weekend's bellator for alexander volkanovsky judging last weekend was horrible give me one american idol judge who could fix mma <laughs> uh randy jackson it's not a, it's, it's a no for me dog I think that's what Probably. he should just say. He should just say at the end of the fight, it's a 10-8 for me. It's a 10-9 for me, dog. We're talking dream fights. And Jorge Masvidal said on Twitter that another Usman fight is his dream. My dreams are often blank because I have sleep apnea. But what do you figure Kamaru Usman's dream fight is? Uh, George St. Pierre. Yeah, that's a fair one. UFC made a BMF belt. This is the fifth one. WWE had oodles of belts in the day. I was always a fan of the Intercontinental Championship. But what belt do we need to see in MMA? I think the belt that we need to see in MMA is a cruiserweight belt. Because I think that 215, 220, cruiserweight. 225, I'd love it. There you go. Love it. That's hitting the speed bag. I feel like I did pretty good this week. I'm proud of myself. All right, we move on to the social stuff for the Graham Craig. Rachel Ostevich won a unanimous decision over Paige Van Zandt at BKFC 19. Is this the biggest moment in the history of bare-knuckle fighting until Randy Couture fights uh, Boss Rutten? No, the biggest moment in bare knuckle fighting was, of course, when Artem Lobov fought Polly Malinaji, and then I thought the bottom's going to fall out of this, but now it's still going, and somehow I'm in contact with the uh, organization that makes the Trigon. Did you watch that? No. Yeah, there's a BK, there's a there's a bare knuckle organization. They had Mike Goldberg on commentary. They had I really have to find this. They had Polly Malinaji on commentary. They had like a who's who of guests. 
who's the the former NFL kicker that's from like Paraguay? And he's got a perm. <laughs> no idea. They had that guy. Um, but anyway, they, they, it, it was pretty neat to see. But for me, man, I hate bare knuckles so much. I don't know how big it was. I didn't see a buzz on social media. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't watch the event because I don't care. So to me, I know I'm kind of deflecting on this one, but I, I honestly don't know. It, it To me, the Malinaji Lobov. And and yeah, that, that, was, that was the be all end all. I mean, you would think that, you know, in all due respect to Bear, uh, to Barstool, this has Barstool written all over. Rich, two, two super hot girls who are known to be super hot girls fighting bare knuckles has BK or has Barstool written all over it. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't think it's the biggest moment in the history of bare knuckle. Let it never be said that Craig Allen is in the king of segues. One Twitter hitter, Artem Lobov has retired, Craig. What is his legacy? Well, he just lost to a silver medalist in a fight that nobody watched, and then he retired. So how weird is that? Um, what's his legacy? I'll tell you what his legacy is, John. I have a squiggle on that poster from Artem Lobov's last UFC fight, his last MMA fight. I, I don't know. He, he's going to be considered the GOAT to the end of time for a lot of people. Uh, he lives on in Chris Gritzmacher's nightmares after he knocked him out on the ultimate fighter, like knocked him out cold. Uh, Artem Lobov is a funny meme. He's a good trash talker. He hated me in person. I think that's what he's going to be remembered for most. <laughs> All right, post it to the book. I defer to you on this one because I really couldn't find, uh, I didn't do a lot of looking for it, but I really couldn't find. Talk to me about this pride rules in Colorado business. So Colorado is basically going to allow one championship rules. Now, if you're really on the underground whisper network and you have to have like a cup to the ground to hear this one, you know that my Reddit handle is you slash pride rules MMA. <laughs> That's what gets me up in the morning is this kind of stuff. So you're basically going to be allowed to Adriano Morais, Demetrius Johnson, knee to the ground, soccer kicks, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be uh, legal and allowed in Colorado. It kind of sets up a potential move for one championship to host events in Colorado. Don't know if that's the biggest market for them, but I just kind of wanted to get the thoughts on that one. I mean, a totally different rule set than what we're used to. Do you think it's going to make a big dent in the landscape or is it just kind of a another nothing and it's going to be like Pride 33? You know, I, I don't think that it's going to make a big dent in the landscape, but I do think that, you know, th this is one of those things that, listen, I'm a big proponent of the UFC reigniting the brands that they bought from the past and let whoever they want to run them. I think if you really want to put Bellator out of business, that's the way to do it. Um, because, you know, give them some other buddy, somebody else to, to battle with. Strike Force, you already have a big enough roster as it is. So re re bring back the uh, Strike Force brand, bring back the Pride brand, put them back to where they were, but run them as UFC companies with UFC employees. And um, you know, if you want to go against your one championship, bring back Pride. If you want to go against Bellator, bring back Strike Force. So I think something like this should get the UFC's attention just to see if people have an interest in that rule set and the difficulty in getting sanctioned by certain, I mean, obviously, if they're going to Colorado, they're not doing it because um, financially, well, maybe it does make sense financially, but they're, they're probably doing it because that's where they're allowed to fight. So um, I, if I was the UFC, I'd have an eye on it, but I wouldn't take it all that seriously. What I would do if you're the UFC, go back. You remember when they had the 25th anniversary show in Denver and they had it yes. at what's the Pepsi Center now? Is it I don't still know the Pepsi I, Center? I don't, I don't think, think it so. is. But the, the whole point of where I'm going with this is it was it was all throwback. So if you're going to go with this rule set, have it at like the Walgreens parking lot that was where McNichols Arena used to be. And then just throw it back to UFC one and make it really funky, weird. And as a segue to a Walgreens parking lot, I went to Salem, Massachusetts. I was incredibly underwhelmed. And at the end of the tour, they went, if you're looking for the hill where they used to hang the witches, they bulldozed it, and now it's a Walgreens parking lot. Way to go, Salem. I had to drive around for 20 minutes to even find where the fuck everything is because it it's just, like, tucked away, and there's hardly anything. couple things. One, it's called the Ball Arena now. And two, 
I am a little bit upset because I think the Phoenix Suns are changing the name of their arena to like the Footprint Center or some shit. And it's like, first of all, you just went to the finals. That was a horrible time to change the name of your building. But, um, well, maybe it's not because I'm sure you probably demand more for the naming rights. But I think that it's just crazy that like some of these, you have these, these, um, teams it's like they play in like the bojangles center and it's like when i was a the kid it was like King? yeah the smoothie King. I, when i was a kid everything was named after some guy and then somebody got smart and said well we could just sell the name of this place and uh props to the guy that thought of it but man does it make for some shitty named buildings but we digress craig let's move on to start the conversation i think finish strong might be a little thick this week because i know we both have a few things we want to talk about but start the conversation this is the question i have and it's about tj dillashaw and I went out of my way to not bring this up. We talked about Dillashaw earlier. I want to get your thoughts on how you think a fighter's legacy should be affected by missing time due to PEDs. Because we, we accept the fact, and we can put a timetable on the, the, the PEDs. We know when they popped. But we just kind of treat it like, okay, this guy popped on July 1st. He's now suspended until July 1st, two years from now. And that's the only window of time that he's, he's involved in PEDs. When the reality is, and Uriah Faber had a lot to say this week about the things that he knows about what T.J. Dillashaw was up to. But, you know, the reality is this guy is, was probably into, involved in more than we are aware of. But is the fact that we can't nail the dates down, does that mean, like if we look at Barry Bonds, right? We know he did PEDs, but how many home runs did he actually hit on PEDs? Who the fuck knows? There's no way to know. Who cares? Well, that's one way to look at it. So my question is, do you think that TJ Dillashaw, he's suspended, he loses time, that's the penalty. But when he gets back, he comes right back to being Killashaw, wins a fight and should now be fighting for championships? Or should he be back to like the bottom of the barrel? I'm a weird guy on PEDs. Like I, I have some weird stances on this. Growing up, I was always I, like... I was always the kid in class that thought that uh, professional athletes deserve whatever money they get and they should be paid way more than brain surgeons and lawyers and teachers because they deserve it. Because if you don't think that they should make that money, then don't support the team. Don't buy this, the Portland Sea Dog shirt. Don't, you know, don't watch them on TV. They're not going to make any money if you don't watch them. So I was always that kid. I was also the kid that like if you pop for steroids, I really don't give a shit. Like sometimes I would, and sometimes I wouldn't, wouldn't, what would you rather watch John guys throwing 200 mile an hour fastballs and hitting absolute moonshots every time the ball goes out or piddly little ground balls and the shift, which one do you want to watch? It's a stupid question, right? It is a stupid question, but listen, here's what Craig Allen's tuned into guys, which if you don't know this by now, here's, here's the, the John Franklin education. You are paid based on the amount of money you generate which is why I am paid nothing as a teacher because teaching fourth grade is nowhere near anyone's career. No one can draw a straight line to yeah, like, I was a great fourth grade teacher. This guy's going to go be an engineer now. So that's what it comes down to. And Craig's plugged into that very early, but yeah, I'm with you. People come to see home runs hit, not bunts laid down. Yeah, that's it. Like my, I, I have two parents that are teachers, right? So I same deal. Right. But when, when I look at this, how should a fighter's legacy be affected by missing time due to PEDs? I, I think a lot of people still think very highly of Anderson Silva. Do they not? They do. Uh, Vanderlei Silva. They like, do. Uh, Juan Camilo Ronderos. He popped today for cocaine. So. Fair. <laughs> uh, but yeah, to me, it's a tricky one. I, with the TJ Dillashaw conversation, it's, well, yeah, exactly. How far do we go back? How many samples do we test? He took the two years... A lot of people were upset. Some people were on the fence of, well, he came clean, but he only came clean because he got caught and he came clean a long time after. To me, Dillashaw's EPO usage really tarnished his legacy for Anderson Silva. You know, his PED issues didn't tarnish it and he's still kind of active. So he's a weird one. It depends on the person. Uh, but, you know, moving forward in a lot of other sports, I'm, I'm cool with PEDs. MMA is a little weird because, you know, you throw the right haymaker at the right time and you, you could really hurt somebody. So that's where, yeah, I can see in combat sports, PEDs are, are a much bigger issue. And obviously I'm saying a lot of this with a grain of salt, but the baseball one, I'm not baseball. Go ahead. 
I want to see superhumans play baseball. Yeah, I think the the my big thing is the the amount of disconnection between physical um, contact, right? So if you're hitting a baseball now, is it more dangerous for some juiced up guy to hit a baseball down to first base? I would say. I would say yes, it is more dangerous for a juiced up guy to hit a baseball down to first base. I would also say do what I've done in every baseball game I've ever played in is when the bigger guy comes to the plate, take a few steps back if you're playing first or third. Like, you know, use your head. So I, I'm with you. I, I agree that, you know, um, that maybe, you know, I just don't like guys – that are juiced up hitting each other in football in you know, one thing that we've never talked about is PED use in basketball because you can't draw a connection, Could not to be, care less, but you can't draw a connection to being on PEDs and necessarily being better at that sport because you know, you still got to make shots and all that. When, when in reality, it'd probably be a, a perfect sport for PEDs. There's more recovery. Uh, there's, you know what I'm saying? But that's just yeah, something like, that doesn't really come up. Well, Luke Thomas get into this on Twitter over the weekend. I, I did see that um, because, yeah, you when do you ever see soccer players and basketball players testing positive for PEDs? Not very often. Do you think they're taking them? 110% they are. 110% they are. And there's there's definitely things you can't detect in MMA. I mean, geez, they couldn't figure out the CPO thing with TJ Dillashaw for a while, right? So – I. Testing's going to come a long way. I'm sure we'll get like a Balco scandal in one of these sports someday. But uh, for me, I'm cool with it as long as it's not a combat sport too. All right, Craig, let's go to finish strong. A lot happening. So I'm going to give you mine, and then you can give me uh, yours, and we'll go from there. So my first thing in finish strong that's kind of on my mind, and, we, you know, we do it with the quick hitters here. My first thing that's on my mind is, you know, we'll do a little trip down memory lane, okay? July 29, 2017, shouts to uh, MMA History Today, which is where I get these. Um, July 29, 2017, Tyron Woodley defeated Damian Maia to defend his belt. July 29, 2001, Sakuraba became the first fighter to stop Quentin Jackson when he choked him out. July 29, 2017, John Jones and Daniel Cormier competed in their highly anticipated rematch. July 29, 2005, in what was his final fight before making a return to the UFC, BJ Penn defeated Henzo Gracie. So let's get a little trip down memory lane. We're licking gloves. Um, I want to start with Chris Weidman's leg. Uh, they're saying it's not healing properly. They're saying he has to go back in for surgery. Listen, we can't prove that the way that Weidman's been conducting himself is the reason why the leg's not healing properly, but it's kind of a bad look. Do you think Weidman should have maybe chilled out and 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 not rushed back, or really he's a a, a wash old fighter anyway? So who cares? If people can see that on the screen, you see those two red marks right there. See that? So I got hit playing hockey, and I broke both the bones of my arm and my wrist. Um, so. You know, they ask you when you break it the next morning, do you want to get surgery today? We reset it, the degrees, the angles, everything looks right. You can wait a couple of days. I waited a couple of days. Then I went back in. It's set the wrong way, but obviously it hasn't healed yet. Right, John? You're a medical guy. I am. So I, well, I, dropped, I dropped out right before wrists. I, I went in. <laughs> I got the I got the surgery on it. I got like the pins that they put in, then they take out afterwards, and it really hurts a lot. All this to say... I went about it the right way. I had a cast on, then a soft cast, but I'm an idiot. And I said no to physical therapy. And while I still had a cast on, I was overextending my arm. And now my shoulder's out of line. And now I'm like five or six years later, my shoulder's still out of line. And it hurts because I'm an idiot. Do you think I would have thrown a baseball with a still broken arm? Hell no. This, this is, it's stupid. Why would you make yourself look like a tough guy? Nobody gives a shit. Most people want you not to fight and for you to enjoy your retirement. Fuck, fuck the Instagram, fuck the clout. I think this is one of the dumber things I've seen. Hopefully it's not due to the fact that, you know, what? Like two months after, not even two months after, he's walking around on it. It just seems really dumb. I agree. Listen, I have nothing as we move on, but the most 
illustrious of fighters in my contacts. So we'll move on by showing you this guy. Can't see. Oh, yeah. Rob Emerson is going to fight Charles Felony Bennett in bare knuckle game bread. What are your thoughts on that fight? Uh, I mean, Felony it, tells me Rob, it tells me Rob Emerson's a crazy son of a bitch. He's going to fight that guy. Well, Felony Bennett, I don't. When was the last time he won a fight anywhere? That's that's a great question. You tell me what you think about the fight, and I'll tell you the last time he won one. Uh, I'm cool with it. I mean, I feel like there's got to be like some Luis Palomino for the winner. Is that where we're going with this? I think that's probably where we're going with this. That <laughs> Luis Palomino seems like. Listen, let me just tell you a few things that you're gonna love about Charles Bennett's tapology. If you decide to go, there's a First lot of all, L's. There is. He's he's thirty and forty one, folks. But um, he's on eleven streak, eleven it's, loss, eleven fight losing streak. Which you it's don't get like to say looking. A lot. I I just quickly. I saw this promoted yesterday. It was fighter A versus uh fuck. What's his name? Is it Shannon Riggs in MMA? And I went, what what are we doing? Why are we still doing this? But continue. Yeah, yeah he's been on a little bit of a skid, um, <laughs> which is to say the least. He kind of looks like, if no one knows who Charles Bennett is, first of all, this is all I ask you to do. Go to YouTube and type in KJ Noons and Charles Bennett. It'll make your day better. That's number one. Number two, he looks like, if you don't know who Charles Bennett is, imagine if Donald G Glover from you know, Childish Gambino, the guy from Community, had a crazy-ass uncle. That's Charles Bennett. But, uh, yeah, I'm interested to see anytime Rob Emerson fights. I like him as a guy. I like to watch him fight. So I, I'm interested in the fight, but uh, I don't expect Crazy Horse to, to, to break the losing streak against Rob Emerson. I can't remember the name I'm looking for. It's not Shannon Briggs, but, Frank, it's a heavyweight. It's a heavyweight. Either way. No. Uh, We'll go back to the list. There were a lot of different things that we could have covered. Uh, you know, Chris Weidman's leg was gross. Joe Rogan talking about why he interviewed Conor McGregor. Well, he invited me over. So what was I going to do? Say no, it's Conor McGregor. What did you make of that? I know we're a ways away from that pay-per-view, but were you cool with this? Like, obviously now everything's a meme. The, the, the two, two biggest memes on Reddit are Joe Rogan interviewing people and Joe Rogan sitting in a tub. You know, it's funny. I, I always look at it like this. If I just take a snapshot of what's happening, am I comfortable with it? The fact that Joe Rogan had to sit on the ground in the octagon or the mat in the octagon just to conduct the interview automatically fails the eye test. So he should say to himself, I'm sitting my ass on this mat to interview this guy. I'm not doing it. I, at least take a stool, something, man. He's laying on the mat. It just the whole thing just came off as weird. And I mean, Connor did what Connor does, which is try to promote the next fight. Um, so I, from that perspective, I get why Rogan did it. I just think there was a different way to handle it. You know, I would have been like, listen, broken leg or not, get this guy on a stool. I'm not going to sit my ass on the mat. Um, a couple that I got. Tatiana Suarez injured again. I mean, is she just snake bitten? I mean, is she just not yeah. ever going to be what we thought she was going to be? Who? Because she was booked against who? Roxanne Montefiore? Was that the fight? I think so. so. It, it, it's a real shame. And I mean, you know, you can make a lot of moves, especially at 125, having Miranda Maverick losing to Macy Barber, even though she didn't, because, hey, Randy Jackson's got to judge MMA now. That's what it's come to. Um, yeah, it, that that's disappointing. I really kind of going through these. Um, what else? PFL. They, I mean, it was all but kind of done, but they announced their August card for their finals. Not a lot of big names. <laughs> Not a lot of big names. We're, we've got an interview coming up with one of these PFL uh, lightweight finalists. To me, he's a big name, but he's the biggest name out of the four that are left. So yeah, that's, that Anthony makes it pretty, pretty easy to guess. And it's Lucid Not Anthony, Anthony Pettis because he's out. Deal. No, that's what I'm saying. Losing him was a big deal. I think they were really yeah. banking on him like – because, you know, Rory McDonald is what Rory McDonald is, but Anthony Pettis is a good-looking guy. He's got the tattoos. He's got the Showtime kick. He's the got a history. beat him in Pettis' first fight in PFL. I know. Right. <laughs> so that's that's the thing. I just think that, you know, they were expecting to do a lot with Pettis, and they, they're not able to do that. A couple more that I got. Uh, Amanda Nunez and Juliana Pena is off. Um, thoughts? 
Do you, do you just wait it out? Yeah, they're going to wait it out. I think the fight's stupid anyway. I know you disagree, but like <laughs> Juliana Pena, are you kidding me? Uh, it's a it's a terrible fight. So, yeah, just wait for Nunes to get healthy. She's going to win anyway. And yeah. In Juliana's defense, in the defense of the fight, they're all terrible. I mean, Amanda's a generational fighter. She's going to bust everybody's ass. You got to put her in there with somebody. I think that Juliana deserves the shot as much as anybody else. And Lastly, I think that Norma Dumont deserves Holly Holm at featherweight. And so it shall be. Uh, and last for me, um, I saw this little thing about Jake Paul saying that he's in talks with Connors people. Uh, how much do you hate that? I listened to spit and chicklets this week and Paul B. Sinet went, apparently Jake Paul said something about him and now he's roped in. I think everybody's roped into the Jake Paul hype. I don't think you're going to have a fight with Conor McGregor at all, ever. I don't. Anything else? No, that's about it for me. I'm excited to get back into the, the swing of things with early stoppage. I'm going to be away next week. It's going to be another remote episode, but those are always fun. And the audio quality usually turns out. Uh, somebody actually hit me up today, asked me about the microphone. So shouts to, I want to get this one right. Now I've got Chris Cyborg's fight league up. Lags, at lags underscore the capper. Ask me about the microphones. We're blue Yeti people here. So, yeah, shouts to lags capper. That's that's all I've got. Craig can be followed at Craig Allen FFB. I can be followed at some corner man. The fight is good. Stop. We'll see you next week. Craig, say something witty. Bare knuckle. Don't watch it. See you next week. Peace.